Okay, so welcome online everybody. Um, this is Deb from the Centre of Excellence for Prescribed Burning and i um, quite um, pleased today to bring you two presenters about drone use in prescribed burning. So we have um, Brad Burke from Department of um, Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions in WA, so that's the Parks and Wildlife over there. And we also have um, Dale Appleton from Parks Victoria who's standing in for Rich Adams who unfortunately had to actually go out and do a burn today. So thank you to Dale for stepping in at short notice. So um, to start with, I will just hand over to Dale and he can, um, he'll give the first half of the presentation and then um, Brad will move on from there. If you'll just want to introduce yourself, Dale, and off you go. Yeah, good day all. So um, obviously at very short notice, I'm filling in for Rich Adams, um, as the slide suggests. Rich has a very active role in fire inside Parks Victoria in the state of Victoria. Rich is also the chief pilot for our ARPAS program, our drone program within Parks Victoria. Um, and he rang me just before. He's actively engaged in prescribed burning right at this second. Uh, he did wish to pass on to you that unfortunately he's not flying his drone. He's actually in charge of the thing. Um, Myself, I'm Dale Appleton. I'm the team leader of geospatial sciences inside Parks Victoria. I'm also an ARPAS pilot. As well as that, I'm an infrared operator, air observer in Victoria's uh, airborne information gathering program. Uh, I'm also a uh, operational firefighter. So with that introduction, um, if anyone has any questions uh, through the way, feel free to jump in and ask me a question or two. So Rich has put together a, a, a presentation on a, a particular burn uh, quite close to the township of um, Hepburn Springs. So I'll get going and show you what we're up to. Rich has asked, us, asked me to cover a whole bunch of things, um, which you can see on the screen. Why use RPAS in plan burning? what aircraft, um, how we went about doing the Manning's Road burn operation, uh, the different products that we in Parks Victoria use, what worked, what needs to work. Um, more importantly, what the Burn OIC thought of the uh, program and considerations for the future. Good question. Why use RPAS? Why use drones in planned burning? Uh, our view often uh, drones seem to be a, uh, a solution looking for a problem. But in this case, plan burning, we think, suits the use of drones perfectly. They are cost effective. Uh, they are easily accessible. Inside Pax Victoria, we have a fleet of aircraft scattered around the state and experienced pilots. So they're able to be deployed quite quickly. They certainly are safe if used correctly. Um, uh, aviation use inside Victoria is highly regulated. Uh, the incorporation of drones into that highly regulated environment was a pretty much a straightforward thing. Um, they're certainly suitable for planned burning conditions because the weather we burn in in Victoria more often than not the wind speeds and wind directions are perfectly suitable for using rotary winged RPAS in that you don't want it too windy because otherwise you have restrictions on where you can and can fly. Um, they certainly do provide significant real-time situational awareness. For all you people out there that have worked on burns, if you've ever wished that you had a tree or a tower or a hilltop that you could look out over your burn and get a good understanding of exactly how it was progressing, they work perfectly in that particular environment. Um, they can be tasked at the locus, lowest local level. So we can respond to a, a burn. We can have someone out tasked immediately to work on that burn. The pilot can be part of the burn team and then just separate out when work needs to be done. Quick turnaround, aircraft and data. Indeed, a, a pally case in the back of a ute is what we typically work from. So we can get that pally case open, we can get the aircraft out, and we can deploy it just about immediately. 
better than satellite imagery for mapping. Uh, as a geospatial analyst, I'll probably take issue with Rich on this one, depending on scale. But at the scale that we are burning at around townships, uh, you know, five hectares, 20 hectares, 100, 200, 300 hectares, they certainly are very useful for mapping an area. Uh, if you're burning at much bigger scales, landscape scales, the uh, the analyst in me would go to satellite imagery uh, and the resolution there, it's cheaper. Um, yeah, it's not a silver bullet, absolutely. Uh, the drones and the aircraft we use uh, are perfect um, in a bunch of different uh, sort of situations. You step outside that, then you will need to be looking at something else, another platform. Uh, Rich has just put up a nice little comparison here between um, just the available Google Earth imagery on the left and the this is a processed uh, ortho mosaic that Rich has done out of the um, out of the drone on the right hand side. Um, so Parks Victoria has a fleet of both fixed and rotary winged aircraft. That's Rich on the left flying a DJI Inspire 2, I think that one is. Um, Parks has decided to, in the main, run with DJI uh, equipment and depending on what the actual task is, we will vary the payload. So if we're doing infrared work, we will use particular infrared cameras. If we are, um, are using, uh, doing uh, veg health mapping, we'll use different sensors. The aircraft on the right, much to our horror, we did actually buy and uh, it turned out to be non-functional, so it got returned. Um, there is a salutary lesson for those of us that work in public services. You, you don't do someone else's uh, research and development for them. Um, pick something that's tried and true and preferably pick something that's tried and true by someone else that has learnt the hard way. All right, here's the Mannings Road burn that Rich worked on. You can see on the map on the right that it is a bush block. It is tucked in and about and abutted by open freehold land, um, which provides us a very good opportunity to put an aircraft up. So on the left hand side, I'm probably sure you've all read this already, but you can see um, the process that was put in place and I'll just pause while you have a quick read through that. So there's a bunch of different tasks that the aircraft is doing throughout that burn and we can run through those. So here's a bunch of products and this is um, the first, the primary one is that view, that overview, aerial observation. So no different to getting a helicopter or a fixed wing and being able to talk to your air observer who can give you a give you everything that you'd ever want from an air observer. Um, you can record smoke monitor if we can do smoke monitoring, I'll give you examples of that. Thermal imaging, coverage assessment, asset oversight, time lapse footage. Uh, products for community engagement, social media, products again for safety and training aids, and uh, 2D, 3D and elevation models for uh, products for, that come out of that. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I was wondering how the video would work. Um, I'm presuming the rest of you are seeing what I'm seeing, which is a smeared piece of video that is not rendering that well. That may be my network link. I'm not in a very high speed network where I'm working from today. So no, it's I said I getting speed as well here, so um, Yeah, cool. Uh, it's not your network, it's just the, the platform. No, thanks. Good to know. Um, 
for any anybody that burns up hard close to the private public land interface, uh, getting an, an idea of your assets, how close they are, what the burn progress looks like, how much smoke, flame activity, the rest of it, so real-time intelligence. Um, RPAS are perfect for that. You can see there's an open paddock immediately adjacent to the asset. That means the operator can deploy the aircraft immediately from an open space. The operator has to have a visual line of sight to the aircraft to operate it. So having an open space like that is perfect. Um, you put the aircraft up, you can very quickly uh, assess how well the burn is progressing. Um, good product, you can take snapshots of that, and send them back into your IMT if you've got one or to your public relations people. Always good to be having uh, putting some stuff out during the day of the burn so your communities can see what's going on. Um, on that theme, a bunch of images showing both that Rich took specifically um, on the outer images to show smoke plume um, and smoke plume development, how high it was, how far it was travelling. And then in the middle, there's a town of Hepburn Springs almost hard up against the burn. A fantastic a piece of, um, of data there just to show again to local communities the work that's been done. You can see the smoke's drifting away from the township, which people in the community would no doubt enjoy. Um, over in that funny smear was a tree falling over in the video. Um, again, Rich put the aircraft up in this instance to view operations where we've assessed a tree as being a hazardous tree, which is in the still on the left. You can see there's a bunch of folks standing around a tree. The video on the right, not playing that well, just shows a machine pushing the tree over with a safety observer. Um, again, both those products we will use for our internal training. So it's really good if you have the opportunity to put one up and get an overview of a particular process that you'll then use for training later on. And some of the fun stuff, post burn mapping. Um, I'm not sure of my audience here, but there's a pretty straightforward process to send an aircraft up, fly a pre-programmed pre flight path, acquire a whole bunch of images, and then process those to produce a bunch of products. The first of those is an ortho mosaic, so just a classic aerial photo. Uh, done post, that aerial photography is pretty good. You can use it to assess uh, burn coverage. Zoomed right in, you can see through the canopy at the ground cover below and assess that for burn, not burnt or part burned, which is what Rich did here. Uh, you can see the little green patches. Those green patches are unburned area inside the burn block. And because we're burning to prescription, uh, I can't remember what Rich said. I think this was meant to be 80% 80 um, 80 coverage, something like that. So you can pretty quickly, with a bit of processing, uh, give a pretty nice output. Uh, zoomed in, that's the same image that you're looking at before, but zoomed in. Um, you can see there's an unburned patch on the left. Uh, no leaf scorch, which is good in this particular instance. The targets were not to have leaf scorch, but to still burn the, um, the gra uh, have the ground fuels all removed. And you can clearly contrast the unburned, burned for burn effectiveness evaluation. Um, another product coming out of it is a digital elevation model, which Rich has produced here, which is blue is low, bright red is up really high. Uh, that in its own right is better viewed, and I think the next slide will show you this, as a 3D model. Now, that 3D model can be uh, viewed as part of a burn briefing. So you can put that up on an iPad and talk to your sector commanders, If you, depending on what size you burn. You can turn this turn the image around and play with the 3D model so that you can get a real good picture of what slope, what fuel looks like, what your canopy looks like, 
proximity of assets. Um, it works as well as uh, interpreting a topo, um, topo map or a mud map trip, trip, uh, drawn on the side of your ute. I guess I live and breathe this stuff, but for me working on a burn, if I've got that in front of me, that is really useful for me. That's the kind of an image I can stick in my head and recall it while I'm working. Uh, I think this is a non-playing 3D model. So you can see slope aspect. The, the imagery renders the top of the canopy as a surface. So where there are holes in the, in the canopy, you can see dimples. But yeah, it gives you a pretty good idea of what the block looks like. All right. Here's Rich's summary of it what worked, what needs to work. From my perspective, it's the size of the burn area, the elevation, um, and the ability of the pilot to maintain visual line of sight of the aircraft. They're the key things. If you're going to put an aircraft up, you have to have visual line of sight to the aircraft. That's uh, CASA Air Law. You can't be looking at a pair of goggles and fly the thing around like your, your kids do. So. That's pretty important. Um, the Burn OIC, and there's a, a little summary of what the Burn OIC thought of this. The Burn OIC does get workable information. So they get intel, it's uh, timely, it's usually pretty accurate. Um, you probably read all the rest of this because it is some detail. Um, the RPAS, for me, things like having the RPAS crew there, the general firefighters are easily integrated into planning and operation. Your RPAS crew can swap in and out of roles. They can go into observation if they need to or they can contribute to the burn effort at the same time. Um, <coughs> excuse me, on task rapidly. Yeah, less than two minutes from request to observation. It literally does take less than two minutes to have the aircraft uh, safely off the ground from a, a radio call saying, can you have a look? You can have that aircraft up in the air way less than two minutes to starting to provide intel. Um, and in this instance, Rich operated from the private land adjacent. That gave him good line of sight out over the top of the entire burn so he could fly the aircraft safely. Um, in Victoria, we work very closely with our air desk, so all fire aviation is handled centrally. So we just, we slip into and work well with the air desk and with the, with the aviation staff. Um, his cost, naught dollars for three days. Um, cost for three days, not including staff, plant or equipment. Um, the, the true cost of actually having an aircraft there for a day, the aircraft we're using and the cameras we're using around three to four thousand dollars as a capital outlay. So you work that out over four years. Um, images on board, depending on what you've got, are another couple of thousand dollars or a thousand dollars or so. Um, needs work, authorisation and paperwork between different agencies. Who would have thought? Um, we just in, again, in Victoria, despite the fact that aviation is pretty well integrated, a little bit further work needs to be done so that we can deploy seamlessly. Um, yeah, downlinking and availability of imagery for the Burn OIC and IMT, we have the greater we, the DELP and Parks, have systems in place now where depending on mobile phone coverage and data coverage, we're able to live stream the data coming out of these aircraft. We live stream out of our AIG platform, so that's a helicopter with an infrared camera. We live stream the data out of that. Uh, equipment redundancy, yeah, it'd be nice to have two machines and spare parts. Um, that will happen. And pre-planning of launch recovery locations, that, I was talking to Rich earlier about that because we're involved in, this is prescribed burning, so it's planned. It's a case now where as you go through the planning phase, 
you need to get an RPAS pilot involved when you do your burn plan to look at launch recovery locations uh, for different wind speeds and wind directions. Um, it just will make things a whole lot easier. And um, I'll leave you to read this, but this is the burn OIC's perspective. I was just going to say that I note on the um, the burn IC thoughts on the photos were of great use as a tool during the day two briefing. So I think I forgot to say the burn went for a number of days. Um, getting an aerial perspective for the crew um, on day two is probably pretty a pretty good thing. Um, from a mapping perspective, often aerial photography is seen as too dense in information, but purpose-shot uh, purpose imagery like a box or video of burn progress is a different matter. So, yes. Uh, the very last point may need more than one unit on a larger or more complex burns to allow coverage of operation at the scale it's required. There does come a cut point where it's actually more effective to start using aircraft and air observers than it is to using RPAS and it all has to do with scale. Planning considerations. Exactly. Treat it as you would a manned aircraft. It is no different to having a helicopter or a fixed wing overhead with an air observer or two. That you ask exactly the same questions. Somebody, and you want a RPAS pilot to work this out for you, would be visual line of sight. So that is, where can the pilot operate the aircraft from so the aircraft does not go out of view? Airspace and flight restrictions. Again, that's your RPAS operator that's going to tell you uh, as part of the planning consideration, um, what limitations there are. You, again, your pilot is going to make a recommendation of the product required uh, with a caveat that if you're doing mapping or burn intensity mapping, you may require a more specialist role to uh, assist you with that, so someone from Intel or mapping. Um, again, requirement for landholder permission. Usually we do that anyway. Um, I don't think I've been to a burn hard up against um, freehold land where we haven't had to whip through a gate to deal with a bit of bark or something that's set fire to um, some pastures. So usually you're working quite, quite closely with your adjacent landowners. <clears throat> um, information flow, data management, video quality, both those, you want to have those in place. Um, again, working for state government, we do occasionally strike problems with data speeds and ability to handle large amounts of data across networks. Uh, sufficient planning time. Uh, sufficient planning time is really one of those things that just should be built straight into your burn plan. It's no different to planning your burn communications um, or how you're actually going to ignite the thing. It's just another part of the process. I think that was the end of my presentation. I'm missing the odd slide or two. So I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. We'll hold the questions to the end, Dale, when I unmute everybody. So we'll just now pass straight on to Brad. And Brad, do you want to give yourself a quick introduction and then you can um, go forward with your slides? Yeah, good day. Uh, good morning all, or well, it is morning in WA. Um, yeah, my name's Brad Burke, work for Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions in WA. Um, I've been in the business for, since 1981, started with the Forest Department, uh, worked in the crews on the ground for 20 odd years and been working full time in aviation for the last 15. So my day job is looking after aerial suppression and ignition operations for the for the agency. 
and I'm accredited in all the airborne and ground-based aviation roles. Um, I've seen some advertising of this that I was uh, called an expert in the field. I certainly wouldn't put myself an expert in the field. I just want to take you through what us as an agency have, uh, have gone through looking at aerial ignition, the reasons why, um, the trial that we have undertaken and where we're moving forward. So I'll, uh, I'll make a start. Um, just a little bit of history. We, we first did an aircraft burn in WA in 1965. It was Pingra Block Down Warpole. Um, did that in conjunction with the CSIRO and that was back when we were the, with the Forest Department. Um, we did some more operational testing of aerial ignition in uh, uh, post that and we did some further trials in 66, 67 and we achieved in excess of 188,000 hectares burnt. And from that point on, um, the Forest Department and, and the uh, uh, agency since then, you know, we continue to aerial burning and we aim at doing around 200,000 each year in our forested areas and then in the uh, remoter areas, you know, it, it does go out into the millions of hectares. So aerial burning is a, a big part of our, of our business. Um, with the planning to, to, to use RPAs for, for aerial burning, we, we first met with uh, Yamaha Sky in April two, uh, 2016 and it was some 18 months later until we actually undertook a trial. A couple of reasons for that. One was um, just the capacity as, a, as an organisation to dedicate people to, to work through that. And, and number two was making sure that we had everything in place for it to be successful. Uh, so it just took a little while to work through. Um, a bit of pre-trial planning for us was um, we providing Yamaha with a solid brief of, of what our agency's prescribed burning operations uh, are, um, taking them through a burn prescription and all the burn approval process, which is you know, quite exhaustive and uh, um, takes a lot of time. So we're making sure that Yamaha actually had some understanding of our business. Um, Brief MR on the DVCA protocols and operational requirements and undertaking aerial burns, what we actually do on a given day, what the objectives are and how, uh, how our different aerial ignition techniques assist with now achieving you know, the objectives and such. So we spent a fair bit of time taking them through that. So we took the Yamaha team to one of our districts, got them to meet with a, uh, a couple of fire practitioners, you know, district fire coordinators and such, so that they got a, a good solid understanding of it how aircraft, whether they're manned or unmanned, can help to achieve um, the, the required uh, burns, objectives and such. Um, what sort of incident, incident structure that we work under, and whether it's manned or unmanned, we, we, we had decided we would uh, work within the same structures. And we got Yamaha to give us, because we're certainly in our infant stages as, a, as an organisation on using uh, RPAs, whether it's for firework or other, so we got them to give us a good solid understanding of the CASA rules, regulations that they have to work within. Um, and they also give us some history on, on where they've come from, uh, uh, which goes back some 30 years uh, in, in the RPA business. And the, the capability and limitations of the phaser uh, RPA that um, Yamaha provided to us to, to use for the trial, so they took us through what that, what that can do and what limitations it does have. Um, that's a photo of the, of the phaser RPA that we use and just to give you an idea of the size of it, so it's, you know, it's three and a half metres long, it's a, it's a fair, fair size bit of gear. I think they're worth somewhere around 250, 300,000 dollars to purchase. It's not a cheap piece of gear. A couple of reasons why we were looking at using RPAs, and number one for us was safety. Um, some of our small prescribed burns in our heavy timbered country, uh, the understory is it's extremely thick, so unless you've got a, a dozer or a loader pushing walk trails through, um, you know, ground crews can't actually walk through it to ignite it. Um, so we either put walk trails in or we use manned aircraft helicopters and we're operating low and slow, so we're, we're within the high uh, velocity curve, so if something goes amiss with the aircraft, we get an engine failure, you know, the, the crew in the aircraft are at uh, high risk of serious injury or, or worse than that. Um, so using an RPA for that type of burn would be something that would, would uh, certainly um, lessen the safety, I would, sorry, raise the safety of our crew. It wouldn't have men, wouldn't have people sitting in, in the aircraft. 
Another one that um, our fire practitioners have raised that, uh, um, that is when we have uh, live edges on our, or either prescribed burns or containment lines for bushfire is where if they want to strengthen them edges, we put ground crews in behind it. Um, if we get wind changes or reignition, you know, we're putting the ground crews at risk, particularly if there's um, if we're in some steeper terrain. Um, so again, RPAs for that type of uh, work would, would be very handy for us. Um, we, we visited numerous sites to try and get a, a, a suitable site to do the trial. Uh, at the time, Yamaha Sky didn't have CASA approval to do any operations outside a line of site. So for us, that, that really did limit us having a, a, getting a suitable site. So we, we ended up settling on a site which was actually within a previously a previous 12-month-old uh, prescribed burn, standard Jarra forest, and it was flat country. Um, the burn had some unburned pockets, which we were going to target for the trial, and we based a helipad on, on a gravel airfield, so it was a, a, a good good area for us to base ourselves base ourselves out of. So that was sort of where we ended up for the for a trial site. Um, in the just going back a little bit with the um, with the trial site because we can't go outside a line of sight and the, the height of our trees and such, basically once you sort of go 50, 60 metres uh, inside the burn area, you know, we were basically outside a line of sight. So anything outside of basically running lines down the edge of the burn, um, was, was we couldn't actually achieve legally. Um, the aircraft itself, with full fuel, it has a payload of 32 kilos, but. Um, it's actually 40 kilos. That's a that's a typo. It can actually lift uh, 40 kilos. That that machine with uh, with full fuel. At speed, so it's around 40 knots. That's about 75 k's, and an endurance of about 90 minutes. Um, and it has a rain dance. It had a rain dance three incendiary machine mounted. So it's a standard incendiary machine you can buy off the shelf, um, fitted to the fitted to the aircraft. Um, so. And Raindance and uh, Yamaha have been working very closely together to get that integration to work prior to the trial. After the, uh, so for the trial, Raindance provided the bombardier. Um, so currently, uh, currently the operation of the incendiary machine on the RPA is actually by someone separate to the um, to the pilot and. There's a thousand capsules mounted onto the RPA as well, which gives you some capacity. That's a photo of it. So that's the um, the standard. Where's me? Have I got a dot here, Deb? I can't see me dot. Anyway, that's you can see the incendiary machine mounted underneath there, with the capsules to the back. Of. There's no dot here, Deb, for me. So that's fine. No, that's fine. But uh, I think people can clearly see the the, uh, the phaser RPA with the incendiary machine mounted at the front, and then behind that, that's uh, the box of capsules. So there's a thousand capsules in that box. And again, the the capsule box again is that's a standard box that uh, the RPA that uh, the Rain Dance Two uses. So there's there's nothing made differently for this RPA operation than what they're using than Rain Dance produce for their um, for their manned operations. So that makes it reasonably simple. Um, the operational trial, uh, we operated under a standard aerial burn structure, so there's an ops officer, incendiary ops supervisor, um, which was ground based. Uh, they were standing with the, the bombardier and there's two pilots. So for this particular RPA, it's a two pilot operation, so there's one pilot in command, but if the uh, aircraft actually, the RPA actually has an issue, it's a separate pilot that brings the aircraft home. So it is quite um, resource hungry if you look at that. You've still got a, we had an IOS, two pilots, and a bombardier. There was a few people. Um, all that burn approvals were as per standard aerial ignition ops. Uh, Yamaha uh, ensured all the CASA approvals were in place. And what we did was advise our local aero club and, and lo other local operators of our operation who were down operating out of Manjimup uh, within sort of. 10 or 15 k's of the local airfield, which is a busy sort of regional airfield for, for WA. Uh, that's the that's the crew. Uh, just a little bit of interest. This gentleman here is that's the Mark Dixon. He was actually involved in the first manned um, 
aerial, aerial burn in WA in 1965. So he's actually uh, started then and was actually uh, quite involved in, in getting us to the point of doing a trial as well for a bit of interest. So uh, at this point we'll play the video. Probably a drone on steroids. If, uh, if you've ever looked at a machine this size, then this is something that you'll uh, find fairly unique. So Yamaha has been involved since the early um, 80s. They started first development. So in 1983, they started development for spray applications. The current sort of platform they've got now was developed in mid 90s with the GPS, out of GPS and so forth. So then their stabilisation systems. So yeah, it's been a, about a 30 year um, time. Okay, it's still all green. Okay, that's good. That's good height. Height's good. This is uh, the latest technology that we can view because it's, uh, it's an expanding and growing concept. These smaller aircraft, and particularly where they have autonomous flight, uh, you can use them at night. The other aspect, of course, is that you're not exposing crew or anybody on board the aeroplane to any undue uh, risks or pressures. It's a tool that's got huge potential, yes. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, most likely this will become part of the, um, the future ignition platforms. Stand by and dropping. We started aerial ignition uh, in 1967, so to see it come to this, I think, has been an excellent progress. This is a great safety opportunity and activation for Parks and Wildlife to, uh, to establish and evaluate the value of this type of uh, drone technology for its future toolkit. Working with Parks and Wildlife has been fantastic so far. Uh, the guys have been more than helpful accommodating for what our needs are, to learn what we need as, and also then to teach us on, on the other side, to teach us what they actually do. So it's been a really good uh, experience so far. So I've been enjoying it. The trial worked well, we were, we were happy with the trial and we certainly found um, the team that we were working with, was uh, everyone was working towards the same cause. So from the operational trial, um, the pilot undertook a, a reconnaissance flight of the area, um, the pilot completed a dummy flight as per CASA regulation, so we still met all that. Um, we got permission, the, the standard uh, per permissions through the ops officer through to the IC to, to undertake the burn. Now, we did several lines were undertaken close to the, uh, to the airfield edge. Um, the RPA operated well with the pilot in manual control for some lines and we also had the RPO in uh, autonomous mode for some lines as well, which, which also worked well. Um, and obviously the RPA had to stay within line of sight. Uh, capsules that landed in the unburned pockets ignited as per normal, um, so that was good. And the RPA flew as planned and we achieved good ground ignition so from us what we were looking at with the trial was to make sure that, that we, could, that we uh, could get good ignition and that the aircraft was flying and everything was linking in together so the machine, uh, the RPA and the incendiary machine were talking to one another and we had the controls on the ground to, to make sure we were putting capsules in that in the right location. Um, a bit of a summary of the trial. Uh, the first one I've spoken about, incendiary machine worked well, good, good ignition on the ground. One thing was you can't adjust the incendiary machine speed from the ground at this point. Um, I know rain downs are working through that, so that's that's not ideal. So the only way we could actually adjust the speed was uh, by 
um, the actual ground speed of the RPI itself. Um, the RPI is slow to accelerate to required airspeed we found, so uh, leading into overignition adjacent to edges um, would be resolved if entering burn area from outside boundary as at required airspeed. So we just got a couple of things to work through there. I don't think that's a, a major one for us. Um, not having approved operations outside of line of flight limit really did limit us. So basically we, we said to Yamaha there, until you can operate outside of line of sight, we, it's not, we don't see too many uh, scope for too many aerial burn operations for us. Um, operation with people hungry, you know, two pilots, a bombardier and an IOS. Um, that's the same number and probably one extra than we'd have for our manned operation in the aircraft. Uh, cost is similar to manned operations uh, for pretty much for using that aircraft to uh, using a B2 Squirrel for us going and doing a couple of, of small two to 400 hectare burns. The, the, the cost in a day would be around the same. Um, we had no live video feed to the iOS on when we did the trial, so that's a long way from ideal. So you, you, we couldn't see what the percentage take was and we couldn't monitor rates of spread um, from the RPA that was dropping the capsules. Um, all parties worked well together um, and all in all, like I said before, we, you know, it was a successful trial for what we were looking at. Uh, moving forward, um, Yamaha now has CASA approval for operations outside of line of sight and that significantly opens up the operational scope for us. Um, we and uh, Yamaha now has a live video feed direct from the phaser to an iPad or you know, to a device on the ground. So that uh, and the actual iOS, um, they'll be able to have control of the camera on the RPA, so they could actually turn the camera, zoom in, and look at whatever they wish to while we're actually undertaking a burn. So we could put some lines in, get a bit of height, um, and then uh, have a look at what the uh, what the um, capsules are doing, what the five behaviors on the ground to see if we need to adjust, to adjust our, our strategies to, to achieve our objectives. So I think that's a great move forward. Um, we were, we actually were set to do a burn in our spring, uh, in uh, sort of October, November of last year, but we put that back because Yamaha, actually Yamaha put it back, they weren't convinced that their video feed was um, going to be successful. So we put that back. We're now setting up to do a, a few small two to four hundred hectare burns in May of, the, of this year. So um, probably the first week of May is what we're looking at. Um, so I think what you can see here is we, we are very much in our infant stage in aerial burning with, with RPAs. Uh, done the one trial uh, two springs ago and we're moving forward. I'm very interested in Dale's presentation there. And, and uh, catching up with him at some time with what where the Vicks have gone. It looks like they've, uh, they've uh, doing some good work as well. So that, that's it for me, Deb. Great. Um, thank you, Dale, and thank you, Brad. So before I open the lines to questions, I'll just run through the questions that are on screen. So in terms of the cost of the ignition, um, Brad, is that just the cost of staff? being about the same or are you factoring cost of hire of aircraft and everything as against the cost of the purchasing the um, RPAS? Deb, that's Brad here. Was that a question for me? So you were, you were saying that the cost is about the same as manned mission. Is that just the cost of staff or does that in, include the cost of aircraft as well? It's the cost of, of hiring the machine. All, all the aircraft that we use manned, we, it's contracted aircraft, so there's obviously standing rates for the day and then hourly rates, and we have our crew yep. on board as an IOS and a bombardier, to currently with uh, hiring the, uh, the phaser from Yamaha for a day and, and undertaking a couple of burns. The actual cost of the, that we would pay to a contractor would be around the same per day um, to, un to, uh, to achieve the same sort of um, outcome. Okay. And Dale, there's a question for you. How is viewing or interpreting the live streaming video in the ICP handle to ensure that the focus of the ICP is on the burn and not on the video? Yeah, good question and it's a perennial question. It's the same, same thing as having radio feeds coming in and having your entire 
uh, incident management team listening to a radio feed and trying to make calls on on ground operations versus doing what they're probably meant to do. Um, it's all about discipline. Um, if the feeds are being watched by someone intel or planning or mapping, I reckon that's pretty good. Um, if everybody's staring at it, then they're not doing their jobs. So it's about having discipline and professional teams behind the uh, behind the burn crews. Okay, and a question for you, Brad. I think someone answered it, but you might just confirm what the high velocity curve is. Yeah, I think Andrew's uh, answered that well. Basically, it's your, it's your, uh, it's the speed of the aircraft and versus the the height you're operating above the ground. And if you're um, going slow and you are low, you you're within a curve where if the, um, the aircraft uh, loses an engine, the pilot has very limited opportunity to auto rotate to achieve a soft landing. So you know, you're operating within there, it's, you, you're at higher risk of if serious injury if something goes if something goes wrong. And a, and a final question for you, Brad. Have you trialled aerial ignition at night? Uh, we have not trialled aerial ignition at night. That's something we're uh, we're very interested in. I think that will open up our our, um, our uh, period for you know, being able to undertake uh, prescribed burns. But we haven't, but we're, we're certainly very interested in it. Okay. I'm just going to um, open the lines up for anyone else who wants to put their question in person. The conference is now in conversation mode. All participants are now unmuted. Okay, um, does anyone have any other questions for Brad or Dale? Andrew Marnie up in Queensland for um, Dale, I think. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Look, Dale, with operating your crews, um, how did you find it because of the restrictions of line of sight if your pilot and crew were operating some distance away from the instrument control point? Um, usually, from my experience in running operations very similar to this, um, you are probably no different to an air observer in a platform overhead in that you're having a conversation by radio with your burn OIC or if you've got crews specifically wanting um, intel, we do most of our work over radio anyway. So it's a case of having the pilot operating and an observer standing handling radio traffic right next to them. Um, I forgot to add into this, we're looking at exemptions from that 400 foot height as well. So in terms of line of sight, once you start removing the 400 foot height limit, you can operate the aircraft a lot higher, which means your uh, areas you can operate from, um, you can operate from smaller areas, uh, if that makes sense. So you get a much better overview. But yeah, it's a good question. Radio. Any other questions for Brad or Dale? At the risk of hogging it, Andrew, again, I've got a couple of questions for both, but I wanted, sort of don't want to, to take over the conversation. That's, that's all right. Go ahead. Just by way of background on um, Rural Fire Service in Queensland, had five years in our air operations and was involved in the early days with our operations with, with, with the use of drones and UAVs. For Dale, um, because the imagery you get from a drone is 2D as opposed to 3D when you're using air observers. Did you find it needed people to adjust to how to estimate flame heights and rate of spread? So flame heights and rate of spread is usually done from um, from the video feed rather than still imagery. So that requires having again uh, an air observer kind of person or an offsider to the pilot that can evaluate that from the live video feed. The still imagery coming off it is more for after action work. So processing it into aerial photography and the like. It's actually the live video feed that gives you the, the, the flame heights uh, and the rest of it. Um, back to you. Sounds to you found like we did where you've got the pilot and you still need the air observer. So the, 
the requirements for crew are the same whether it's a manned or unmanned flight? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, and by the time you start playing around with live video feeds or integration in, into mapping systems out in the field, it is no different to running that in um, like the platform I work in, which has got a that's a squirrel helicopter with a yep. IR camera operator in the front and a mapping operator in the back. Okay, one last yeah, question then. For, for to ensure you had endurance, yeah. what sort of battery supply did you have? That's where I got it from. A large box of batteries, Thanks. mate, is how it works. So you bring the aircraft back down, swap the batteries over, put it straight back up if that's what you need to do.